Hi everyone, Shane McMurray from The Wedding Report. Uh, welcome to our new series, video podcast series on the jewelry industry, specifically wedding focused, and then we'll talk about other jewelry stuff. Uh, but I have some special guests. I have Megan Crabtree and I have Marty Hurwitz with me uh, on this particular podcast. Guys, thanks for joining me. And uh, yeah, hey, uh, Megan, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, let everybody know who you are and what you do. Yeah. So I'm Megan Crabtree, um, CEO and founder of Crabtree Consulting, and we consult manufacturers and retailers all over the world. Excellent. Marty, why don't you introduce yourself too? Uh, this is Marty. Uh, I'm the uh, founder of the MVI, and we provide market research and uh, strategic consulting to companies in the gem, jewelry, and watch industry all over the world. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining me. Um, so I've got the experts in the jewelry space with me, and uh, we're going to, this in this episode, we're going to talk about like the population changes and how that's impacting the wedding industry uh, and the jewelry industry going forward. So um, we'll kind of just get right into it. And uh, let me, I'm going to share my screen here. So for those of you listening to the podcast, uh, we'll provide these slides for you guys. And so if you, um, if you want them or need them, let me know, and we'll uh, provide those for you guys. So um, so the first slide here that we have is basically the population by age range. And this really breaks down all of the population in the U.S. This is from the 2019 ACS and census data. And uh, as you can see, I mean, we're in the core age of marriage right now. Like there's, there's a ton of millennials getting married. We know that. But the core of the population from 25 really to 54 is significantly higher than anything after that and anything uh, coming before that. So I really want to talk about like this particular piece because this, to me, this this looks like a nice red flag, uh, especially, if, you know, maybe five, 10 years out from now. But for right now, this looks like an excellent opportunity for the jewelry industry, um, wedding space and the jewelry industry going forward. So um, let's talk about it a little bit. Marty, what are your, what are your thoughts on this particular thing? Well, the jewelry industry right now is booming. And uh, uh, oddly enough, it started booming during COVID and it is continuing to boom. And you can see why that is right now. This uh, age demographic, these three high bars are uh, in their prime jewelry consuming years. And uh, the younger 25 to 45 year old group is likely to be consuming jewelry both at weddings and beyond for the next 30 to 40 years. Uh, they're, a lot of them are getting their first uh, well-paying jobs right now and are finding their highest discretionary spend right now. They're lining up with brands very well. Um, they're trying to find brands that are similar uh, to their uh, ethos. And uh, this is all playing into the fact uh, that the jewelry industry is doing so well. It's also related to the fact that lab-grown diamonds as a category is exploding uh, with this younger generation as well. So very positive uh, effect that the demography is having on the jewelry space at this present time yeah. and likely for the next few years. Uh, Megan, how does this kind of impact uh, jewelry businesses about, you know, how they reach the, this particular core group, uh, where they're located, you know, how do they get them in the door? Yeah. I mean, in terms of, of the consumer, more than 60% um, of the consumers a year prior to buying an engagement ring come in to buy a gift for that significant other. And so a lot of times in many cases, they're intimidated by walking into, into a store because they almost think that they can't afford what is in that particular store, especially the larger independents that, that have big brands. So I would recommend definitely, especially in the upcoming seasons, you know, of the holidays coming up with Christmas, Valentine's Day, to have that lower price point and to advertise that so that consumers feel like they can walk into the door and giving them that experience, whether they're spending $200, $500, $1,000, is what's going to win them over um, to come back to you for that engagement ring purchase. 
Great. Uh, so, I mean, what about like, it's very interesting. You mentioned that like 60% of people come in like a year before to buy something for their possible uh, engagement, you know, right. Is that, I mean, like before they get engaged they're buying something as a gift, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, where, how are they reaching them? What, I mean, what's the, what, what are they doing to reach these guys? So, you know, if you look at the different holidays and the average spend per holiday, you know, the average spend definitely fluctuates. Um, I always definitely recommend in terms of Valentine's Day to focus on that price point under $200. So the average spend is usually around 175. And a lot of retailers, you know, when we share this information, they say, well, I don't want to sell, you know, a $200 piece. We, we only start at, you know, a thousand. Right. Um, we've seen the data behind this um, and the customer coming in that spends, let's say $200, you know, this could be for their nanny and then they go off and, you know, buy their wife a $10,000, you know, to Corey engagement ring. Right. So a lot of them aren't seeing the bigger picture. They're just thinking of it as I don't want to sell a $200 item. I want my people to be selling a $5,000 engagement ring, but selling that initial price point is what is going to get you that, you know, engagement ring customer. Um, yeah. Marty, I mean, that kind of fits pretty well into like the, um, the lab grown diamond space, right? Yeah. I, this is a fascinating point that uh, Megan brings up too, because basically these uh, uh, young consumers are, dry run testing a jewelry store uh, before they get engaged. And this is a perfect opportunity for jewelry retailers to offer them a low price point item to get them in the door, sign them up as a customer, show them that they can be trusted, that they have high integrity, because there is a high paranoia threshold to overcome as a young consumer walking into a jewelry store. So uh, it's, that's a great thing to learn for jewelry retailers that they can do this. And it's also a great opportunity for the lab grown category where they can at least introduce that younger consumer to the lab grown product uh, where their dollar goes a little bit more in terms of a size of a diamond and, and even in fashion looks, which might be that, you know, year before gift that they get, um, you know, there's a lot of possibilities in the lab grown diamond category. Yeah. Well, what about, um, so, I mean, as you can see the population, <laughs> the number of population pretty much like cuts in half in the 20, you know, after, after the core age of 25 to 34 right now, what should businesses be preparing for? Um, you know, I know it's five to 10 years, but really you need to start thinking about that now, I think. And, um, what, what do you guys, how do you guys feel about that? Megan, what are your thoughts? I mean, they definitely have to find a way to to target, you know, this demographic that obviously drops off. I mean, at a at a fifty percent rate, I think it, it still goes back to you know, having those attractive loss leader price points, you know, that that get them in the door to understand, you know, your business. Mm -hmm. I would also say that, you know, whether you're speaking of, you know, this twenty five to fifty four range or even the demographic that, that drops off, like you're 20 to 24, regardless of the client that you're referencing, I think it's really important that you're meeting them where they want to be met. So mm -hmm. in, in June of 2020, Signet Jewelers announced, which is your Kays, your Zales, your Jared, that they had over 100,000 virtual appointments. You know, in 2020, Costco sold a $600,000 diamond online. So if, if they want to be met and, and shop for jewelry at the convenience of their home, I would definitely be investing as a retail jeweler how you provide this virtual experience to match the same experience that they would get in store. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marty, you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. First of all, the, the drop off in the population is going to be precipitous. Uh, in a few years, and uh, we're probably going to be overstored in terms of brick and mortar stores. And so if you're going to be in the business, you're going to have to get much more efficient about your omni-channel experience uh, for the consumer. Now, most smaller jewelry retailers have no idea how to do that, and they really yeah. need help with that. Many of them don't even have next generation 
coming into the business management, and that's a problem. Many of them don't have females coming into the business management. That's another problem. So they need to get better at omni-channel marketing and omni-channel presentation and transaction where the customer wants to be met. And it could be online. It could be in social media. It could be direct selling in social media. Uh, and it could be in brick and mortar. The, the consumer gets to choose whatever method they want to buy, and we have to give them all of those choices. But they also have to get more um, uh, evolutionary in terms of their hiring practices and of next generation staff and uh, and different genders and uh, ethnicities as well in terms of how they staff. They have to get their staff and their management to look more and more like what the next gen consumer is looking like. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, let's take a look at this next uh next chart here that I have. Um, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but uh, what this really shows is like the age of people getting married. This is from the ACS uh, survey data from the Census Bureau. And basically, this is a breakdown of the year they're married and, you know, what percentage of people in those age ranges are getting married. Um, you know, as we talked about, like, there's a significant drop off in the population. Um, the thing that's going to help and kind of maintain the number of people getting married is that the younger generation uh, decides that they're also going to get married and kind of move into that, that they want to get married. I mean, marriage generally is flat or declining in the U.S., and it has been declining for a very long time. Uh, what we're seeing right now is obviously just a, a, some pent-up demand from the COVID situation that we just went through. Uh, but the younger generation, are they going to get married? And 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 that's probably the bigger question. Um, and as you can see, kind of like at this bottom piece here, which is the less than 20 category, there is some increase in there. And we know also the core age of marriage is 30. Uh, the, the core uh, median age is right around 30. And you can kind of see in that, that category, the 34 and even the 25, there's, there's more people getting married in that age range. So there's a possibility it could, could stay pretty flat um, or grow. It's obviously going to grow a little bit in the next couple of years, but it's probably going to be flat and hopefully uh, we'll continue to stay where it's at. But but you guys have any thoughts about the fact that we, I mean, this the population is going to drop off. Do we, I mean, what should companies be be thinking about? Megan, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, one thing I, I would definitely consider um, is investing, you know, time and strategy into a referral program. So where whereas you have, you know, your demographic that is booming right now in that 30 range, start a referral program where you can start getting not only their friends, but their family. And their family might be in that younger demographic that when it does drop off, you already have them as a customer before then. So I would definitely recommend um, some sort of incentive that you're providing your consumers for referrals um, as well as, as reviews, because we know that, I mean, gosh, more than probably 60% of the people before they walk into a business, you know, they look online and, and do their research. So incentivize your consumers on a referral basis as well as, um, sharing their experience online. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, there is this, I mean, that, that's a good point, but what about the older generation? Like, there looks like there might be some significant increase uh, in the older generation of, of the population as well. So we're talking like 60 plus. I mean, maybe they're getting second time marriages and we got anniversaries and all these other things. I mean, Marty, how does that play into the jewelry space? Well, two, two things there. That's a great point because the, the, the uh, next gen consumer of today, the 25 to 45 year old, they are going to age and they will have a lot of discretionary spend at their, at their disposal as they age, probably well into their 70s because the life expectancy is getting quite a bit longer now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and right now, believe it or not, the jewelry industry actually has a very nice core demographic of older consumers that may not uh, have had a lot of money when they first got engaged, but now want to upgrade their engagement ring uh, to a bigger stone. Uh, and so there's there's quite a bit of uh, uh, product being sold to um, 
you know, 60 year old and plus consumers who want to uh, get a little better, bigger, better stone. Mm-hmm. It could be a second marriage. It could be a second marriage or it could just be a, a yeah, first marriage where they couldn't yeah. afford the stone when they get. So that, that, so that's, that's big, but I want to just add something to what Megan said that I think is fascinating too. We, we could, we should all be taking a look at the Hispanic consumer too, because the Hispanic yep. jewelry consumer is probably the most prolific demographic of jewelry buying. Um, and particularly at a young age. And, and one thing that is going to be required is jewelry stores are going to be necessarily get younger consumers or younger gift opportunities for younger consumers uh, as customers early on. Now, the jewelry industry is terrible at uh, servicing multi-ethnic groups, particularly Hispanic. Very few stores uh, have Spanish-speaking staff. There are practically no jewelry websites that are translated into mm-hmm. Spanish. Yet this consumer demographic is a giant growth opportunity that most companies are ignoring. I think as uh, the age demographic shift, uh, paying particular attention to groups like that, where there are younger consumers, more holidays where they're spending yeah. uh, money in jewelry, uh, that would really help them out. Yeah. Well, and the other thing about the Hispanic population is that there's a lot of, uh, you know, when, when, um, when the the females within the family turn a certain age they have a quinceanera and it's a huge party and there's a huge buying opportunity there as well so uh, it's not just getting married but it's there's lots of opportunities in that space i I believe and it's totally you're you're right you're you're absolutely right there's there's uh, at, at least double the jewelry buying opportunities in the hispanic american community than there are in in other groups uh, yet the jewelry stores of today just literally don't even pay attention to that. They could be marketing for those young age holidays and events in the life cycle of those consumers and the, their families, and they could really be capturing a lot more uh, market share from that. Yeah. Megan, yeah. Uh, you know, with the older generation or population, how, how, I mean, I know that there's more people buying online, but I don't know. I, I tend to find that some of the older generation likes to go in and, and, and visit stores. Do, do you find this or are you finding an opposite or something else? I mean, surprisingly, in regards to the virtual appointments, we see this of all ages and it's really more of a convenience factor. Um, so, you know, the retailers that we consult Um, you know, most people at any age can get a text message and press play on a video, you know, (laughs) of of the piece that you're sending them or recommending to them. And, you know, we have many customers that have clients that are in this older demographic that are very successful and do not have time to come into a store. So maybe they're not gonna hop on Zoom because they don't have time, um, you know, but we we had many instances where they're texting, they're sending videos, um, and and they see it more as a you know a concierge experience. Yeah. Um, you know, I I would also say possibly for this demographic, it's it's definitely going to be vital to have some sort of curbside pickup, so that you know if, if you do talk with them over the phone or send them pictures or send them videos or you know, meet with them on Zoom, make it easy for them so that they don't have to, you know, get out of the car um, to even come in the store. Um, You know, I I know a store, you know, right out of Chicago um, that for Mother's Day, I think they had over 600 curbside pickups in just a three-day period. And so um, it, it it definitely works. It's convenient. Um, and it, it plays into the role of um, the experience factor. And so I, I would definitely say retailers really need to look into investing and, and strategizing how they can meet the customer where, wherever they want to be met. Um, I would also say in regards to, you know, Marty speaking of them being aware of, you know, the different cultures that are in their market, 
you know, I would highly recommend that they're looking into different publications or local magazines that target to these cultures, right? So, you know, when I used to run a store outside of Chicago, we would advertise, we would not only advertise in a magazine that was targeted towards the Chinese, but we had someone full time on our staff that spoke their language. And she grew her own business within our business, within her culture. Um, so I, I totally agree with what Marty is saying on that aspect too. Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely need to look at the growing population of uh, diversity, right? Because there's Asian population is growing, Hispanic population is growing uh, in this country. And, and uh, those, are, those are opportunities for, for these businesses, I believe. Um, and and, and Shane, Sh Sh as, as far as weddings go, uh, those demographics also are, are getting married more mm -hmm. and er, and younger, so yeah. it's 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 it concurrently happening both the wedding market and the jewelry market. That those we need to keep an eye on how to service all consumers. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, so let's uh, kind of dive into some some numbers here on uh, like unit sales. So this is kind of a breakdown from the TWJC data, which is today's wedding jewelry consumer. Um, and basically this is a breakdown of unit sales. I mean, this just supports what we're looking at from a demographic perspective of age range and unit sales, uh, from, from a perspective of, um, you know, how many are taking place in, the, in there. It just really supports the same data. You guys have any, uh, thoughts on this particular piece? Marty, you want to? Well, this, uh, it's a, this is just showing the strength of this market. If, if you match up this 25 uh, 25 to 34, all the way to, to 44 age group, um, and you match it up against the other chart we were looking at, where about the split of the age demographic. Yeah. You, this this is really the meat of the matter why the jewelry industry is is booming right now, and it's going to be for it's going to be a good 10 20 years of, of boom time with this demographic because they're just going to get. They're yeah. going to go higher up the socioeconomic ladder. They're going to spend more on a lot of different things. Yeah, uh, and 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 that's that's just confirmed by this chart. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and then let's look at this chart, Megan. You, you were talking earlier about price points and um, you know people coming in uh, to the store and buying stuff early, and then you know, but but the store only wanting to sell them you know a higher price point item. Here's kind of a breakdown of spending on average for, for engagement rings, et cetera, based on age range. What, what are your thoughts here and, and what can stores do? Yeah, so what we find with, with retailers um, is they lack merchandising um, in terms of complete rings. So for example, you know, if we know the sweet spot here between that age group of you know, 25 to 44 is somewhere around that $4,000 average spend, yep. then they need to have a great deal of made up complete rings with live center that are at that $4,000 price point. Um, it's also going to help the retailers in terms of competing with online or their local marketplaces, just because, you know, more than 60% of the people are going online and doing their research before. Every retailer has heard of the consumer coming in saying they found it on Blue Nile and they found it on James Allen and yeah. it's a one carat GSI one and it's $4,000. You know, right. what do you have similar to that? They can't do that with a complete ring. It's ready to go. They're never going to break out the, you know, semi mount and the diamond. Also for the guy that it's intimidating to walk into a store, which we know is the, you know, the case in many, many cases, um, it's easier for him. Yeah. He, he's, he doesn't want to go around and see 4,000 rings and then sit down and see, you know, 10 more loose diamonds and then wait for it. So mm -hmm. I would highly recommend for the retailers that are listening to understand that that average price point is around that $4,000 mark. So it's extremely important that they have a great deal in selection of rings that are already made up with a live center that hit that price point. And definitely don't be shy to put that in the case, right? Yeah. Like yeah. you can have your rings that are under 1500, under 2500, under 4000. And just being transparent, it's also great for the retailers because they don't have to ask the consumer what their price is. 
If the customer sees the prices, they're going to pick the ring that's in their budget. So it right. just makes everybody's life easier. Yeah. And you can always add stuff on later. It's not like you, you know, but you to get the conversation happening, you have to have something available for them in their budget range. Yep. Uh, and then this last uh, last chart that I have here for, for us really just kind of reiterates the whole total market size for the same age range. Uh, you guys have any final thoughts on this? Marty, you have any thoughts on this? Well, the, the market is massive. And um, uh, yeah. yes, there could be a drop off. <laughs> in the, yeah, the, there could be a drop off in the next few years. But the truth of the matter is it's going to be very strong. For a number of years, if the 25 to 34 year old group is spending this much money on their engagement ring, they're going to become customers for life of that store. Uh, I think Megan makes a good point about inventory on hand. Most stores are not very good about that, and consumers really want things when they want it, and they want it, they want it where they want it. And mm -hmm. the stores have to get a lot better at both of those. But uh, you know, in, in terms of this. Um, uh, early price point leader uh, for that consumer that wants to come in early and test out a store before the engagement. It's all about making the customer. If you make the customer with a low price point, they're going to spend more later on. So I don't think that's that big an issue, especially given the magnitude of this total market size that we're looking here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just like, I want to get some final thoughts from you guys. Uh, you know, you know, this episode, we're talking about kind of the demographics of the, of the market and what's happening. So, um, Megan, you have any final thoughts, uh, you want to share on this? Yeah. I mean, I would, I would just recommend to all the retailers out there to make sure that they're meeting the customer where they want to be met and, it doesn't matter what they spend initially, it's what they're going to spend over a lifetime. So, you know, we always share with our retail partners, you should consider every customer that walks in the door, doesn't matter if it's for a watch battery, a $200 ring or a thousand dollar ring, that that customer has a value of a hundred thousand dollars. And we say a hundred thousand dollars is, is the, the spend that they're going to spend in a lifetime. But that also includes all their family and all their friends that they refer. So we build these charts on customers that came in to spend $5,000 on an engagement ring, but they sent us six friends. And so now their average spend is over $40,000. Now they only initially spent four, mm -hmm. but the people they're referring to you. So make sure you're meeting them where they want to be met do things that are different in your marketplace, like curbside pickup, meeting them on the couch virtually, sending them videos, yeah. and just give them that experience wherever that it is so that you can win that customer for life. Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent ideas. Marty, what are your final thoughts on the demographic stuff? Uh, well, dem demography is destiny. And I think the, de the demography we looked at today uh, is uh, quite telling about, A, how strong uh, the the wedding and jewelry space is right now. And that's proven out by what we know about what's going on in the market. Uh, but also the need for the longer term picture is to diversify staff and diversify customers as much as possible. We really have to start looking more and more like what the consumer looks like. And that's self-purchasing females and uh, multiple ethnicities. And we, as an industry, we're not too good at doing that. We need, really need to get better at and hiring and perfecting our marketing for those uh, consumers going forward, because it will get competitive as the population shifts. Yep, agreed. Megan, Marty, thanks for joining me, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us for the show. We'll see you next time. <laughs>